Sanjay, and welcome everybody. Tonight we are going to see some very little seen interviews with Richard Nixon conducted by the man to my left, Frank Gannon. And uh, I've seen the, the clips that we're going to see tonight. And what strikes me about these clips is it's a, a Richard Nixon I've never seen before. I've seen Richard Nixon talk about some of the things that he'll address in, these, in, in the clips that you'll see. But I've never seen Richard Nixon as relaxed as I see him on these tapes. Uh, Nixon was also often very pugnacious and very defensive when it came to the press. And that was certainly true in the interviews that he did with David Frost in 1977, which had been celebrated in, in uh, a play called Frost, Nixon, and later a movie. But I think that the reason that we see a different Richard Nixon in these tapes is because of the man he's speaking with and his great comfort with Frank Gannon. Um, he is very relaxed. He's at times very emotional and provides insight, again, that, that, that I've not seen in interviews that he's given it. So it's much a testament to the relationship, to the relationship rather, that he had with, with Frank. Uh, and Frank, I want to start off by asking you a little bit about that relationship. Uh, you were in the White House during the latter part of President Nixon's administration. What led you to the White House and to work for the 37th President of the United States? And I will add, before Frank responds, that we're going to be seeing photographs of Frank, which will take him down memory lane uh, and will provide cues to talking about his experience in the White House and with President Nixon. And this is our first. <laughs> it's just to wake everybody up. <laughs> well, this, uh, this pretty much is self-explanatory. I went directly to the White House from the uh, adult entertainment industry. Uh, <laughs> this... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this was the uh, uh, this was the official. Everybody, when you joined the staff, you went down to an office in the basement of the DOB, at the photographer's office, and you got a, an official publicity photograph taken. And so this was my official publicity photograph. Uh, I have several thousand of them. <laughs> I don't think it was ever used anywhere except they gave the several thousand copies to me, and I probably have them somewhere. But. Uh, so this would have been taken, I joined in, uh, I, I began as a White House Fellow, which was a program we were talking earlier. Mark, whose fame precedes him, is the director of the Johnson Library, and the, uh, who has come from Austin today, and I'm very grateful that you've done that. Uh, the, uh, this year is the 50th anniversary of the White House Fellows Program, which was uh, proposed, by, inspired by John Gardner, and proposed by President Kennedy and enacted by President Johnson. And so I was a, a White House fellow in the class of 70, uh, 71, and I came down to the White House in, from New York in 19, in uh, August of 71. And so this picture would have been taken shortly thereafter. Let's move on quickly. Yes. <laughs> this was meeting uh, the president. This was, uh, this was uh, obviously in the Oval Office uh, in December of 73, and it's just to establish that uh, that I'm not making this all up. Well, I'm making a lot of it up, but this, <laughs> I was actually there. Well, this moves on. This is, uh, these are uh, 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 tough photos because the, uh, the, uh, the ebullient lad in that uh, December, in that Oval Office picture, which was taken in December of 73, uh, this is August of 74. This is the day the president resigned. So this is August 8th. Uh, I'm in Ron Ziegler's office and uh, uh, Ali Atkins, who was the White House photographer who had been with the, who'd, who had photographed the Nixon family for years, even before the White House, uh, just roamed around the West Wing taking pictures of whatever he saw. So this was uh, me sitting, uh, it's kind of the death watch, sitting in Ron's office. And uh, I was looking at this earlier, and uh, the, the photograph behind, uh, you can see by the curtain, is. Uh, is, is Nixon and Sadat at the pyramids, uh, which had just been taken uh, 
five or six weeks before, uh, two, two months in the, in the last several weeks before uh, President Nixon resigned, he had gone to uh, the Middle East uh, and had been uh, hailed in, in Cairo and Alexandria and then went to uh, uh, Syria, the first president to visit uh, Syria and then went to Saudi Arabia and then to Israel. He squared the circle of uh, Egypt and Israel in one trip and then ended up in Jordan and then uh, came back for a week and then went to uh, Russia. Uh, so that's that day. This was, I have no idea why I was uh, <laughs> in to do the, uh, sent in there because there was nothing I could do. Uh, this was the Oval Office. This is, uh, I went in to, I guess, to supervise the people who knew exactly what they were doing and had done it before. Uh, these were the techs who were setting up the Oval Office for the resignation speech. And uh, the frustrating thing was uh, the, the president, uh, as presidents do, speak, wanted to speak and spoke, uh, as he says in the resignation speech, this was, he was the 37th president, and this was the 37th time he was speaking to the nation from the Oval Office. But you would go into the Oval Office and you can see they had to put down uh, papers or whatever they were to protect the rug. And then they moved the flags uh, from behind the, from, from near to the desk to cover the beam birds in the bookcase. And then they would bring in a, 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 a scrim behind, or not a scrim, but a curtain behind. And then they would put a brown beige cloth over the uh, glass top of the, of the desk, the Wilson desk that the president used. So he could have been speaking from the, you know, the Ramada Inn in Brea uh, for, for all the atmospherics that you got of the Oval Office, but that was, uh, that was the prep that was done of the Oval Office. This is, uh, if the one was the death watch, this is the postmortem. This is Ron Ziegler's uh, office, and this is after the resignation speech, which I guess we watched on the set, on the television set in Ron's office. And that's Diane Sawyer and Ron and uh, me. So we're now about to see uh, some clips from the interviews that Frank conducted with President Nixon in 19, former President Nixon in 1983. All of them deal with the period leading up to the resignation. In the very dark days of August, early August 1974, Frank, talk about what we're about to see. And Frank, Frank, we will we'll roll these clips, and then Frank will set up. There, there are four different sets of, of clips. Frank will give some context around them, and then we'll roll them. So talk about the first set of clips that we'll, we'll see. These uh, clips are available on the Nixon uh, Library website. And uh, we, uh, in, in preparing them, uh, I think of it as an homage to Ken Burns. Uh, there are the clips, but they are preceded by title cards which explain what they are. And so I'm going to be the, the human title card here uh, to sort of set them up. But if you go to the library website, you can see them and they'll have a much more succinct uh, uh, explanation. So we've divided them into uh, three groups and the first uh, clips of which, in which there are four deal with the 1st and 2nd of August. And uh, on the 1st, as you'll hear, the president brings uh, Ziegler, his press secretary, who was, who was then acting as sort of his domestic assistant, and Al Haig, who was acting as the, uh, who was the White House chief of staff, but was sort of acting as the national security person, although uh, Henry Kissinger was, of course, the secretary of state. Uh, and so what uh, the, uh, the, uh, Nixon is telling me in this is that on the 23rd of July, although this, this is the 1st of August, but he's saying mm -hmm. on the 23rd of July, they got the news. This, is, this, will, this will be a slightly longer explanation than the rest of these. But to set it up, uh, the House Judiciary Committee was getting ready to vote on articles of impeachment. There were, uh, the, the, and the math was unrelenting. Uh, there were 38 members, 21 Democrats, and uh, 17 Republicans. Of the 21 Democrats, 18 were solid uh, vote for impeachment. Uh, there were three possible swing votes, people who at least had not committed themselves previously that they were going to vote for impeachment. They happened to be three Southern Democrats, and they were very influential. They were uh, within the committee. They were considered to be very thoughtful people. 
So if they uh, held, if they didn't vote for impeachment, that might affect one or two of the other Democrats, might not. This is a very, this is kind of a last ditch hope, but it was the only hope in town. Um, so the math was the, 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 the congressional relations people came up that if it was possible to maybe hold uh, uh, 16 of the, uh, of the 17, uh, or, or tw uh, 17 of the 21 Democrats, and there, there was maths where, where you could keep one Republican and only get two Democrats, but or you lose, uh, you'd keep all the Republicans. The math was, was, it was a Hail Mary play. So on the 23rd of July, Nixon gets word that all three Southern Democrats are going to vote for impeachment. So this was the Hail Mary play. He decides to call George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, and ask him if he would influence, maybe call Walter Flowers, who was the Alabama Southern Democrat, and see if he could maybe influence him to, to vote against impeachment. And uh, so Nixon's on the phone in the Oval Office, and uh, it was a very curious conversation because Wallace said, uh, kept saying, I can't hear you. And at first, Nixon would just speak louder, and then he figured out what was going on, and he understood that Wallace didn't want to hear. And so he says, uh, well, you know, thank you. And Wallace says, uh, I'll be praying for you. And Nixon hangs up the phone, and he looks at Haig, and he says, well, Al, there goes the presidency. So on the 23rd of July, uh, which was a day before the Supreme Court tape ruling and two weeks before the smoking gun tape was released, uh, Nixon knew he could not survive as president. So the first clip uh, is in, in, he describes uh, what he did as a result of that realization. The second clip, uh, having decided to resign, he has to tell his family. And so he asks his friend, he uses two people as sort of intermediaries with the family. One, both longtime friends. One is Rose Mary Woods, his secretary, and the other is Bibi Rebozo, who was a friend, of, had been a friend since the 50s, since Nixon was a senator and had gone down to Florida uh, and met Bibi there. The, uh, so that's on the 1st of August. On the 2nd of August, uh, uh, the, the president will talk about bringing the family to the Lincoln sitting room. He wants them to read the, the transcript of what became known as the smoking gun tape, which was the tape, a tape of conversation in the Oval Office between Nixon and Haldeman on the 23rd of June, 1972. And uh, it, uh, this tape essentially uh, made, uh, in Nixonian phrases, inoperative the statements that Nixon had previously made about his knowledge, his awareness of the cover-up. So this was a devastating tape, and he wanted his family to read the transcript of it so that they would understand what was about to happen, because the tape was going to be released uh, three days later. So they're in the Lincoln sitting room, and he uh, asked, he tells his family what they're about to, to read, the transcripts. And uh, the, the result is that the family are uh, uh, think it's survivable, and they don't think he should resign. And Mrs. Nixon is particularly adamant that he shouldn't resign. From the 23rd of July on, uh, I knew uh, that uh, we could not survive. Uh, however, when I got back to Washington, uh, in my usual methodical way, people think it's methodical, and I guess it is, uh, I decided I should put down the pros and cons of what options I had. And uh, I had a sheet of paper on that which refreshed my memory. Uh, rather interesting when I read it today so many years later. It indicated, one, I could resign now. Uh, two, I could wait until the House voted impeachment and resign then. Or three, I could, despite the House voting impeachment, go to trial in the Senate, uh, which would take about six months. Now, resigning now was the option I didn't want to do above everything else personally. Uh, I'm a fighter. Uh, I just didn't want to quit. Uh, also, I thought it would be an admission of guilt, which of course it was. Uh, and also, uh, I felt uh, that it would set a terribly bad precedent for the future. I hope no other president ever resigns under any circumstances. The second option was no option at all, to wait until the House voted impeachment, because what I would do then would be to put all of my good supporters on the spot and make them vote for impeachment, which they didn't want to do. You don't put them through that sort of thing. And the third option, go through the uh, Senate with a hearing, uh, I mean a trial, I should say, for six months. I knew that that was unacceptable. Unacceptable because from the standpoint of the country, the country couldn't afford to have a crippled half-time president. 
particularly in this time when I recalled that in 1973, when things weren't as bad as they were now, the Soviet Union at that time was very difficult during that 73 war in the Mideast. I just couldn't risk it, I felt. So after making those notes, I in my own mind decided, well, there's no choice. And so the next day, on the first day of August, this was a week before I finally made my resignation speech, I got in Haig and uh, Ziegler and I told them that uh, I felt that uh, there was no choice but to resign. That night, this is the night that I told Haig and Ziegler that the decision had been made, uh, Bibi Rebozo came up from Florida. Uh, I went out in the Sequoia with him. I told him, and, and I've never seen him. Uh, he's rather swarthy in complexion anyway with his Spanish background, and he just turns white. He says, you can't do it. You can't do it for the good of the country and so forth. I said, well, you've got to help me with the family. And then, uh, so the next day, I uh, had to tell the family. It, it was a painful day. We all met in the Lincoln sitting room, as I recall. Uh, she came down with uh, uh, Tricia, Julie, uh, Eddie Cox, and David. And uh, I had the 23rd tape transcript brought over because I thought that uh, it was important that they see just what the problems were because that was causing concern. Let me say, had there not been the 23rd tape transcript, we would have still had to resign due to the fact that before that transcript ever was made public, as we know, the three Democrats had been lost on the committee. But nevertheless, this was the final blow, the final nail in the coffin, although you don't need another nail if you're already in the coffin, which we were. She was very quiet about it, uh, listening to the others, which she usually does. Uh, but she came down very emphatically uh, against resigning. I mean, we have to remember that uh, during the fund crisis, I was the one that felt that, well, I ought to give my resignation to Eisenhower. And she said, you can't do it. So you can't do it because of its effects on the children. You can't do it because Eisenhower lose the election. He says, these people are just dumb who think uh, that if he does this to you, that they're going to be able to survive uh, and get your supporters to support them in the final campaign. And, and on this occasion, uh, she was a fighter to the last. She was the last to give up. She was the last to give up in the fun thing, the last to give up in 1960, and she was the last to give up this time. Very hard for her. So Frank, the next batch of clips takes us to August 5th. From August 5th to August 7th. Right. Because on the, on the 3rd and 4th, they went up to Camp David for the weekend. So uh, we, we pick up again on the uh, 5th. And which is the Monday night, the, the day the uh, smoking gun tape was released from the White House. So on, the, on the, that night, the Nixon family uh, with Rose Woods went out on the Sequoia. The Nixon family, uh, the president mentioned, Mrs. Nixon, of course, Pat Nixon, Tricia, and, uh, and Julie, his daughters, and David Eisenhower, and Ed Cox, his sons-in-law. And uh, they went out on the Sequoia, and uh, after, uh, while the tape was uh, being released, and uh, uh, the president will describe what he did. Uh, that's the fifth. On the sixth, uh, there's a cabinet meeting. Now, uh, now, he had decided to resign several days earlier, and the senior White House staff knew, and he goes into the cabinet meeting on the morning of the sixth and tells them that he has no intention of leaving before his term is up in January of 1977. Uh, that afternoon, Al Haig comes in, and uh, Nixon provides a particularly succinct uh, uh, description of the situation at that point. Uh, late that night, he gets uh, to his room and finds a note on his uh, pillow. Uh, that's the uh, sixth. On the seventh, uh, the family had a last dinner uh, in the White House in the solarium, which is on the third floor of the family quarters. And it's sort of hidden by the uh, south portico. You can't really see it but it's a, a, a room which is essentially all glass walls, and then there's a balcony that looks down onto the, uh, onto the ellipse. And, uh, and then after that uh, dinner, uh, the president goes to the Lincoln sitting room to work, and around midnight he calls his press secretary, Ron Ziegler, over to, do some, to talk about some final arrangements for uh, the next morning.
we decided that night to uh, go out for one last ride on the Sequoia. That also was a rather eerie ride, I may say. Uh, we talked about everything but uh, what Tricia has called, quote, the subject, end quote. Uh, we talked about a movies that uh, Julie had seen with David. I don't even remember what it was. Uh, we talked about how Rose was, uh, who she was with us uh, during these last days, uh, how she was handling some impertinent inquiries from the press in her usual very effective way. Uh, and so uh, the evening ended rather pleasantly, and I went down below uh, to stretch out, because I'd had a pretty hard weekend, uh, I thought, uh, thinking about all these things. Uh, Rose took the call from Al Haig with regard to the reaction to the tape, and she came into the uh, uh, bedroom down below where I was stretched out, and she read from her shorthand notes. It's about as we expected. Uh, I kind of winced as some of the names were read off of those that had left now, uh, left my support. I understood it, uh, but they, I sort of, I felt, I looked back to the times I've campaigned for them and worked for them and supported them and written them and kind of tough, uh, although I did understand it. Didn't hold it against them. And, uh, but uh, then she read off that the cabinet, however, was standing firm for the most part, and then she left the room. And so I just uh, turned off the light and closed my eyes. Say, uh, uh, Mrs. Nixon was very perceptive, however. Uh, I learned later that after our night on the Sequoia, uh, that uh, even though they hadn't been officially told that the decision was final, she had started to sort the clothes and start the packing. Uh, and so that for three days, uh, from Monday night until we left on Friday morning. She didn't sleep at all. Uh, packing five and a half years of clothes and other mementos uh, preparatory to leaving. It, it, with us sometimes, as it is between people that are very close, uh, you don't have to say it publicly or even privately. Things unspoken say it even more strongly. I knew the cabinet well. Uh, I knew from what I had heard from uh, Al Haig and others that uh, some of them felt that uh, they would like an opportunity to present their views and, in effect, to lobby me to make a decision in that way. Uh, I respected the cabinet, but I wasn't about to allow them uh, to uh, get me to resign. It had to be my own decision, taken in my own way at the right time. That was one reason. I didn't want to give them that opportunity. The second reason was even more important, however. I could not afford a leak. There couldn't be a period of even 48 hours, because the resignation couldn't take place, I knew, in at least a couple of days, uh, in which it was known that I was going to resign. Uh, and I knew that as far as the cabinet was concerned, as good as they were, that there'd be a leak out of there in that big a meeting. Uh, I know that many of them probably didn't appreciate the fact that I didn't tell them, just as many of them didn't appreciate it when I didn't tell them I was going to China. Uh, but on the other hand, there are times when you have to keep your counsel, and I felt that this was one of those times. I regretted it because I would like to have told them, but I didn't think it was the proper thing to do. Right after the cabinet meeting, I asked Henry to come in, and I told him, of course, because we had to inform foreign governments and all that sort of thing. He said, well, uh, he, th he supported the decision, he regretted it, but uh, we, he simply, it just wasn't, uh, it was asking too much to ask me to be dishonored as he put it, by having to go to trial for six months before the Senate. It was the Tuesday afternoon, and uh, I said to uh, uh, General Haig that, uh, uh, that I would uh, resign, but uh, it would be with dignity and with no rancor. And, uh, he said, you will be as worthy, your exit, he said, will be as worthy as your opponents are unworthy. Uh, and then I thought a minute and I said, well, Al, I really screwed it up, didn't I? He didn't have to answer. She often wrote me notes and she'd leave them around. She said, Daddy, I love you. Whatever you do, I will support. I'm very proud of you. 
Please wait a week or even 10 days before you make this decision. Go through the fire just a little bit longer. You are so strong. I love you. Signed, Julie. And then a P.S. Millions support you. Like her mother, she was a fighter. If anything would have changed my mind, believe me, that would have done it. But it was too late. When I arrived in the room, I knew that it was pretty tense. Uh, I can always tell with Mrs. Nixon. I remembered at the time of the fund when we were in Portland, just before going down to make the broadcast. She had a terrible, severe pain in her neck. She gets a pain in her neck and very stiff when under tension. And this time I could see the th throbbing. But when she saw me, she put on a great act. <laughs> I guess it was an act. She got up and she came up and threw her arms around me and she said, we're all very proud of you, Daddy. Well, I didn't know quite what to say, and Ollie, fortu fortunately for me, for my emotions, stepped in and said, you know, I think it would be nice if we could get a picture of Mrs. Nixon and you in the Rose Garden. And she said, no, Ollie, that's too much. I just can't do it. And Tricia said, I'll go with you, Daddy. So I went down with Tricia to the Rose Garden. Uh, it was incidentally quite appropriate that she go because we were able to think back to a happier time, 1971, three years before, when she and Eddie were married in the Rose Garden. We talked about that wedding. What a beautiful and wonderful occasion it was for all of us. And I must say, as I looked at Tricia, she was as beautiful, I think more so then and even now, than she was then. The favorite picture was of the whole family, uh, where both couples and Mrs. Nixon and me, and either on either side. So uh, I said to, uh, I told Ollie that I would, uh, uh, that we would have the picture, and I put on a somewhat of a false front and bravado and tried to arrange it in my usual way. You stand here, you stand here, stand accordion-like so that you won't be cut out of the picture. And Ollie mercifully was quick because we were all uptight tears were brimming in virtually everybody's eyes and then after he snapped that picture Julie just couldn't hold in the tears any longer and she rushed over to me and threw her arms around me and said I love you so much daddy well by that time uh, I couldn't say much either That was, that was now way past midnight. Uh, and uh, as Ron was leaving, you know, he had been a loyal fellow and so forth and so on, and I sort of thought, you know, I've really never given him a tour of the upstairs. He'd seen it, of course, but I wanted him to see it through my eyes. So I had all the lights turned on in the Queen's bedroom, uh, in the uh, Lincoln bedroom, uh, and in the yellow oval room and so forth and so on. And I walked through the rooms and showed them all to him and explained a little about the history and finally took him to the elevator. He seemed to be quite moved by it. And he just said simply, he said, you've had a great presidency, sir. So now we get to the darkest of the dark days, August 8th, when President Nixon announces to the nation that he's resigning the office, and August 9th, the day that, that he departs the White House and flies back to San Clemente. Talk about what we're going to see here. Uh, 
we'll see uh, in two separate uh, sections uh, the uh, the uh, August 8th, which was the Thursday, uh, at 11 o'clock in the morning, he meets with uh, Vice President Ford in the Oval Office uh, to officially inform the Vice President that in 24 hours, uh, 25 hours, he will become the next president. And then uh, in the evening after, and then that evening uh, at 9 o'clock, he gives the resignation speech. And uh, after it, Henry Kissinger uh, comes in and asks, uh, there was a tradition that particularly for the foreign, well, for the foreign policy speeches, Henry would walk the president back the you know, 500 feet or whatever it is from the Oval Office to the uh, residence, to the White House itself. Um, and uh, so this night, Henry comes and asks if he could uh, uh, do the same on this occasion. Tough for him and tougher for me. Uh, we had worked together for many years. He came to the Congress only a year after I did. And uh, we had fought in many good battles. We'd won most and uh, lost some as well. Uh, I told him I thought the country would be in good hands. I told him that it was very important, I felt, for him to keep, him, keep Henry Kissinger. He agreed. He said he thought we had a fine cabinet. Uh, and then uh, as uh, we were leaving, I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I remember so well uh, the last, uh, uh, one of the last conversations I had with uh, uh, President Eisenhower. As a matter of fact, the last conversation I had with him before I was inaugurated. Uh, he called me on the phone. He said he wanted to wish me well. And then he went on to say, and his voice broke a bit when he said it, he said, you know, I have only one regret on this great day. This is the last time I can ever call you Dick, Mr. President. And I said, Jerry, this is the last time I'll call you Jerry, Mr. President. Brought a tear or two to his eyes. I think to mine, too. We shook hands. He left. But after the speech, I went over to the residence. Henry was very, very thoughtful. He, uh, he came up to me and he said, he'd like to walk to the residence with me. He said, I've always done this after the big, the important speeches. And as we got to the door of the residence, he said, Mr. President, history is going to record that you were a great president. I said, Henry, that'll depend on who writes the history. I went upstairs and all the family was gathered in the West Hall. And as I came in, David said, I don't see how you did it. I don't see how you did it, because he had seen the text in advance. And then suddenly they all got up. And they came around, just surrounded me. It was sort of a huddle, sort of a family embrace, saying nothing and saying everything. And then Tricia said, Daddy, he said, you're, you're wet. Your coat's wet through. And I began to have a chill. And what had happened was that the room had been so hot and the tension was so great that I was perspiring clear through the suit the same suit, incidentally, that I had worn when I had gone to Moscow and spoken on uh, television to the Russian people just uh, in 1972. Well, soon the chill went away, and I went down to the Lincoln room and made a few calls to people, uh, heard the chanting outside, uh, reminded me of the Vietnam days, except this time the chant was, Jail to the Chief, Jail to the Chief. Didn't bother me, however, you know, after all, I'd been heckled by experts. I, I guess think, that's, yeah, that's I it. I think we've got one more pot and, and yes. uh, one more batch of clips that relate to August 9th. Yes, the, the, the last day in the White House, the ha last half day in the White House. Uh, the president uh, slept fitfully. Uh, for a couple of hours and then woke up uh, on that last morning, the Friday morning. Uh, the family then said goodbye to the White House staff, which was a tearful uh, goodbye. The White House, the, the, the actual the staff of the House 
uh, up in the family quarters. The butlers and the maids and the ushers were all in a line, and the Nixons went down and spoke to each of them. And then the Nixon, uh, the president went back to the Lincoln sitting room to uh, prepare to uh, prepare for his farewell speech, which was going to be made was made uh, at nine o'clock in the East Room, which was the farewell speech to the uh, actually the administration staff. And uh, at that point, when uh, uh, the president is in the Lincoln sitting room, Al Haig comes in uh, with one minor housekeeping detail or one housekeeping detail that had to be taken care of. Uh, the president then describes the East Room speech, making the East Room speech, and then uh, he describes uh, leaving the White House. Went to bed, didn't sleep very well, and I woke up with a start the next morning, the last day, uh, wondering if I'd overslept, and I looked at my watch, it was only four o'clock. Well, I tossed and turned, then I got up and I walked into the kitchen, uh, thought I'd get a bite to eat. And Johnny Johnson, one of the White House butler, was there. And I said, Johnny, what are you doing here so early? He said, isn't early, Mr. President. He said, it's almost 6 o'clock. And I looked at my watch. As a matter of fact, it's the same watch I have on here. And it's one of those watches, you know, with a battery in. It's supposed to run for two years. The battery had run out, worn out at 4 o'clock the last day I was in office. By that time, I was worn out, too. Went back down to the Lincoln Room, and Al Haig sort of knocked on the door. I think it was perhaps, for him, the most difficult meeting we had. And for me, it wasn't easy. He brought one piece of paper. There was one line on it. He said, you know, we forgot to do this. Would you sign it now? I hereby resign the office of President of the United States. I signed it. He took it out. Then I proceeded to work on my farewell remarks, which were going to be extemporaneous. As you know, all extemporaneous speeches, however, <laughs> require an enormous amount of preparation. And so I worked on that speech uh, until it was time to go down. Very emotional speech. I, uh, I recall uh, uh, speaking from the heart. Uh, Tricia later in her diary, which uh, she let me see, uh, wrote that uh, for the first time she was glad people were able to see Daddy as he really was. Spoke from the heart, thanked them for what they'd done, expressed my pride in the fact that in this administration there had never been an example of anybody profiting financially from having served in office. Uh, told them that uh, they must not allow what happened to me to discourage them, in effect that uh, we learn from our defeats, uh, that life isn't over because you suffer a defeat. Uh, just some of the philosophical uh, guidelines that have uh, enriched and that sometimes, I think, guided me in my own life. I tried to share them. I spoke to my parents, my, my old man, as I called him, and my mother. I said, my mother was a saint, and my old man was not just a common man. He was quite an extraordinary man. And uh, that was about it. Uh, we were then almost past the point of knowing what we were doing. It was, uh, we were fortunately guided by the Secret Service and the rest through the crowd. Uh, we went down and to the diplomatic reception room. Uh, Jerry Ford, he's still Jerry then, he's going to be president in two hours, uh, was standing there. Betty Ford was standing with him. Uh, I shook hands with him. And uh, I said, uh, when I appointed you, I knew that I was going to leave the country in good hands. And he said, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I said, goodbye, Mr. President. And then Betty Ford said, have a nice trip, Dick. 
and Mrs. Nixon came through, and we went out to the plane. Uh, Julie was not going to be able to go to California with us. Trisha and Ed were, and she was at the bottom, uh, uh, <coughs> at the ramp, uh, leading up to the entrance to the helicopter. He kissed her, uh, got into the helicopter. Mrs. Nixon had already got aboard ahead of me, turned around. Uh, there were all the crowd out there on the lawn, as had been so many cases before, and I kind of raised my hand. I don't know whether it was a salute or a wave, but uh, that was it. Turned, went in, sat down in the plane, heard the engines whirl up. I closed my eyes. I was pretty tired then. Been up all night thinking, so forth. And uh, as the helicopter began to rise, I heard Mrs. Nixon, who was sitting in the seat next to us, speaking to no one in particular, but to everyone. And she said, it's so sad. It's so sad. And then as the helicopter went on, uh, I uh, must say, uh, I didn't have any feeling of bitterness or rancor or self-pity. I found myself thinking of what I'd seen in that room when I made my speech. Herb Stein, marvelous man, great economist, one of the most unemotional men in the world. I remember him, I can see him now, tears just streaming down his cheek. Hard for me to finish the speech without breaking into tears myself. And I thought how much I owed to all of those who had worked so hard and how much the country owed to them and how fortunate we were to have such marvelous people, such good people in our administration. And I, I thought of Julie down there and Tricia and Ed and Mrs. Nixon. And I, no one, believe me, no one had a finer family. No one could have had a more supportive, loving, kind family and how lucky I was there. And then as the helicopter moved on to Andrews, it was understandable, I guess, that my thoughts would go to the other times we'd gone to Andrews. We went there on the way to China. We went there twice on the way to Russia, to the Mideast, to Europe, around the world, all the great events and initiatives we were participating in. And I found myself thinking, and this is also rather characteristic of me, not of the past, but of the future. What could I do now? What? Seems presumptuous that I even thought it then. What can I do to see that these great initiatives that we began would continue? And that's the way it was. I think perhaps the, the best description of how I felt then, and, and frankly, uh, maybe it's the description of my philosophy generally, was uh, of a little couplet that I received from Claire Booth Luce. This is in the spring of 1973. Watergate had just exploded all over the place, and she sent me a one little card, a three by five, with this couplet on it. It was the ballad of Sir Andrew Barton, and it read, I am hurt, but I am not slain. I shall lay me down and bleed a while and I shall rise and fight again. That's the story of my life. So, Frank, you were a witness to this history. Um, you were there when it happened. You were not in the East Room when uh, President Nixon bid farewell to his staff. You were at Andrews Air Force Base on Air Force One watching the speech. Can you talk a little bit about what your experience was at that moment? Well, we had, uh, after the uh, resignation speech, we, uh, uh, we were in the West Wing and 
one of the, I was getting ready to go home, and one of the Secret Service agents came in who I knew and said that they were, um, that the office was going to be swept for President Ford in a couple of hours, but until then it was kind of a free zone, and if I wanted to go in, uh, I could. So I went in and uh, was alone in the Oval Office and sat in his chair, and uh, as I told Mark earlier, pillaged his desk of uh, souvenir tie clasps and uh, ashtrays and pens, and uh, then went home for a couple of hours and, uh, and had to be out at Andrews by uh, 8 o'clock uh, because the, uh, the only people who could go on the uh, helicopter, which of course we have right out, right out here at the library, uh, were the family, uh, the President, Mrs. Nixon, Tricia and Ed, and Ron Ziegler. And, uh, and of course, the doctor, uh, Dr. Takashi, who traveled on all the, with, with every president on every trip. Uh, so the people who were going to be on the plane on Air Force One had to be at Andrews by 8 o'clock. So uh, we watched, the staff, the five or six of us who was there, watched the East Room speech on the television set in the president's cabin aboard Air Force One. And I had a, uh, a, a curious uh, sort of, ex, I don't know, out of body experience because uh, after the speech finished, we were all sitting there and we were kind of half watching the, the post-speech commentary. And I'm watching it, and then in my peripheral vision, I would, and it, 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 it cuts to Andrews, and it says the president's uh, helicopter has just arrived, and it shows the helicopter going down, and out of my peripheral vision, out of the window, I saw this helicopter coming down, so we got out of the cabin fast. And uh, the plane took off at 1017. Um, and so this is a picture of uh, you know, what used to, what would have been a completely filled cabin. It was, a, uh, it was like a ghost, uh, it was like the Flying Dutchman. It was sort of a ghost plane. Um, with, uh, and this, the, the back there is Ron Ziegler and uh, me and Diane Sawyer. And uh, it was, uh, the president says that uh, in that earlier thing, that by by the by the time the speech was over, they essentially they didn't know what what was happening. They just went where people told them to go. I think similarly, we Ron, Diane, and I, we I think we were just numbed by that point. Uh, that whole week had been surreal and uh, twenty-four hour days, and uh, so just mentally, emotionally, physically draining. And uh, by the time we we got onto the plane, it was just. Uh, it was just, uh, you're exhausted. So I think this picture sort of conveys that. So what was that journey like from Andrews to San Clemente? And I will note that when you were somewhere over Jefferson City, Missouri, at 12 o'clock noon, uh, President Nixon became former President Nixon as Gerald Ford was sworn in as president in the East Room, the same room where President Nixon had earlier address the, the staff, his staff. Yeah. The president had come back about an hour into the flight. The president came back and uh, talked to, the, I think there were uh, five, uh, there were eight of us in this forward cabin. And then the next cabin was empty, which was the staff cabin. And then the, what would have been the press cabin was empty. And then there were the Secret Service uh, detachment. And uh, so he came back. I think he went back to he, he went back and talked to the Secret Service. But he came and talked to us. He stopped and talked to me, and he said that I had uh, he saw that I had uh, had the foresight to get the seat next to the pretty girl. So, uh, and then he uh, thanked all of us for uh, what we had done in the White House and for. Uh, coming with him on this uh, trip. We had been told, the people who were going, uh, on the Monday, uh, so the 5th of August, Ron Ziegler had uh, asked me that if the president were to resign, would I be willing to, as, as he asked others, uh, would I be willing to go to San Clemente for a month? And uh, that anybody who went would be guaranteed that their job in the White House, in the Ford White House, would be kept so that by going you wouldn't lose your job. And uh, so, uh, and he said to keep it quiet. He, say, he said to, to obviously to keep it quiet, but to start preparing quietly. Um, 
so I guess we had known uh, from, from that Monday on that it was a possibility, but we were only finally told on Thursday, uh, on, the, on the morning of the day before. Uh, the flight was uh, surreal. Um, there was, a, there was a, a touching moment as we were flying, as we were, uh, were, were uh, getting ready to land at El Toro. Uh, the captain sent, uh, Ralph Abertazzi, the Air Force captain, sent word back to look out the window. And we looked and the, we could see the, uh, the uh, I guess it's the five, the, uh, the cars were backed up. There was like a four or five mile backup of cars waiting to get off to that uh, El Toro exit to be there. That was very moving. And uh, we landed at El Toro, and the president made a couple of remarks, and then uh, that was it. So you work for Nixon. Your, your month extends well beyond a month, and you remain a fixture in San Clemente for a while. But talk about, uh, if you would, the Nixons during the immediate weeks after the resignation, upon returning home. California. Well, we of, of course it was a, it was a real roller coaster because we went out for a month, and then that extended uh, for various reasons into the six months of the official transition, uh, which which every president is is uh, allowed by statute, and uh, of course the Nixon uh, those six months uh, he resigned on August eighth uh, and on September eighth. Uh, President Ford issued the pardon. So there was a whole flurry of events. I, I uh, was, was called on to draft the, uh, or, or to work on the draft of the pardon statement. So that was one of my first assignments. To begin with, we just had to deal with the, because there, no, there was no staff, there were only volunteers. Uh, just as our library depends, your library depends on docents, uh, we depended there on the volunteers who came down to sort through these thousands of uh, pieces of mail that came every, every week for months. And, uh, and then he got sick. I mean, to put it mildly, then he had uh, brushes with death. Phlebitis. For, uh, phlebitis, and then he went in and he went into shock. Uh, he went in the first on October, at the end of October, and uh, then he went back in, and that began a period of, uh, of, of, of just touchy health for pretty much from the, the fall of 73 until the fall uh, of 70. Uh, Four until the fall of 75 when it was, and for some months there, it was touch and go. One of the doctors came out and said, uh, I don't want to get your hope up because he might not make it. So that, uh, that uh, occupied us. And then as he began to get better and as the, uh, the period of the transition ended, uh, for, for various reasons, mainly financial. He, he knew that in order to pay his bills, which were staggering, had to, when he left the White House, he had half a million dollars in legal bills that he was then going to be responsible for. And that was, that was pre facto, if there is such a thing. That was before he left the White House. So uh, in order to pay his bills, it was an exquisite uh, uh, dilemma. In order to pay his bills, essentially his lawyer's bills, he had to do television and write a book. And essentially, the lawyer's advice was, uh, whatever you do, don't do television and don't write a book. So, uh, so he decided, he knew that uh, from the past, that in graduate school, I had worked on the, uh, as a research assistant on the official life of Sir Winston Churchill that was written by his son, Randolph Churchill. And uh, Randolph set his book office, as it was called, up in the same way that Sir Winston had set his various book offices up for beginning with his life of his father, Lord Randolph Churchill, in 1906 or whenever it was, uh, through the, the world crisis and through the Second World War and through the English-speaking peoples. So I knew how, how Randolph had set that office up. And uh, so Nixon uh, knew that that, uh, that sort of experience could apply to the writing of his autobiography. So uh, as the transition, the six-month transition ended in February, he asked me if I would stay on and organize the researching and writing of his memoirs. So that's what I did. This is a picture of uh, uh, my parents came to visit. And so this was us in the, uh, the uh, former Western White House office uh, where they met the president. The man on Nixon's immediate right is a clean-shaven Frank <laughs> Gavin 
The good news is that Gerald Ford also gave a pardon around Frank's mustache. <laughs> I had, you know, I think one of the, uh, uh, you know, you wish so often you wish you knew then what you knew what you know now, and I mean, so many times I, I'm not just talking about my hair, my facial hair. Uh, you know, the questions you would have asked the people you meet and the opportunities you have, but. Uh, we're going to see a picture shortly, or maybe next, of the, yeah, the staff. The staff. And this is, uh, I mean, and we were wonderful people, and he was lucky to have us, and he appreciated that. But you think that on August 8th, if you had had the, the Nixon staff, it would have taken the, you know, the convention center, and there would have been uh, two or three hundred just on the White House, and then there would have been 2,500 uh, in the executive uh, branch. And uh, so from August 8th to August 9th, this was the, this was the Western White House staff. And uh, you see friends of the library here will recognize uh, the two bookends, uh, Jack Brennan on one side and Ken Kashigian on the other. And, uh, and, and uh, four in uh, from the left, uh, friends of the library will recognize Loewe Gaunt, who had gone to work for uh, the president in his Senate office in 1951, I think and uh, still comes up here to the library. Um, and uh, you recognize Diane on his right. And here is, this is the book staff. Uh, so there's Ken Kashigian and uh, Diane and uh, Judy Johnson, who was a researcher. And uh, some people say this shows my best side. Uh, so this, these are the sessions that ultimately produce RN, the memoirs of Richard Nixon. Yes. Can you talk about the process of writing that book, Frank? What was that, what was that like? Uh, I organized it, as I said, I organized it along the lines of Churchill had done. It was, no, it was not great rocket science. His, his uh, uh, Sir Winston's and Randolph's idea was that chronology is history. And uh, so we organized, and I, I set the book, the, the, the office of, I was a, they were called young gentlemen because in those days they were, they were only uh, men who were on the staff from Churchill's days, uh, but they were researchers, essentially, who were recruited from universities to provide raw research, and then there was an actual book staff that worked in the book office. And uh, uh, we did in San Clemente what uh, Randolph had done in uh, England, which was to get binders, big, big, big loose-leaf binders, for every day of the subject's life, from uh, Churchill's case from, 19, uh, from 1874 to 1965, in our case from 1913 until then, until, until he resigned, 1974. And uh, in some years, obviously, when he was four or five years old, there'd be a binder with just you know, a couple of baby pictures or very little. But for uh, once he became, went to Congress, and particularly when he became vice president, when he became president, there would be several binders for just one year. And they would be divided into third. The pages would be divided into third, and the first third. And the first third was what was happening in uh, Nixon's life. Second third would be what was happening in the country, and the third third would be what was happening in the world. So for any day, you could open this binder and find out sort of where he was and what was going on. So that was, that was the, in the front of my office, there was a floor, we put floor to ceiling bookshelves and these binders just uh, filled the floor to ceiling. I uh, got from Irvine, I called Professor Martyr, Arthur Martyr, who was a, an expert on the, who I'd met on the Churchill Project, who was an expert on the British Navy, written uh, history, the, the definitive history of the British Navy from the dreadnought to Scapa flow. And I called him and asked him if he had some outstanding graduate students. Uh, which he did, a man called Mark Jacobson and Bob Huberty. And he sent them over, and they, would, they worked in the university library to provide uh, uh, folders of research, background, newspaper clippings, speeches, uh, uh, to flesh out the chronology. And then uh, the way it was divided is that I was the general editor and I worked on foreign policy. Uh, Ken Kashigian worked on uh, domestic politics and particularly the campaigns and Diane worked on Watergate. That was the division of labor. And uh, everything went through me as it had done, not, not me, but in the Churchill office, there was a general editor who, uh, who dealt, uh, uh, who, who was in charge of all the, the, uh, the texts to prepare them to go to the printers. So we would uh, prepare these uh, uh, briefing uh, 
books or folders. And, and when the, uh, the, the research, the graduate students put in stuff, there'd be, you know, enormous folders for some issues. We would give them to the president, and he would, he would absorb this stuff for months at a time, and then he would just go to ground. He would disappear for two or three weeks, maybe a month, and he would work in the upstairs study at the Casa Pacifica. There's a very small room, probably only 12 by 14 or something, uh, glass from the bookcases lining it and the fireplace in the middle, and then windows looking out over the Pacific over Cotton Point, and uh, where he met Brezhnev and others. But he would work there. And uh, when he came back to the office, uh, he would have dictated uh, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 words on this subject. And they would be, that would become the basis of the manuscript. And we would take those dictations and then give them to the researchers to fact check them. And then we would uh, go to the documents and, and, and add documents to them. And then that would be refined and given back to the president. And he would, th th this process sort of continued. And of course, as he went, as the, the time went on, his dictations built until we had you know, several hundred thousand words dictated by him. Uh, so that was the process. Nixon described it as cathartic, writing about the the presidency, and it, it, it helped him to heal to some degree from the, the resignation. Was it an emotional process for Nixon? I, you know, maybe, uh, but uh, not that I observed. It was a, uh, uh, he was a very rational, he was not a man who wore his, his, his uh, emotions on his sleeves, on his sleeve, uh, or his sleeves. Uh, he didn't, uh, he didn't believe that the presidency should be a soap opera, and uh, he didn't believe that how he felt was anybody's business. And in many cases, I think he felt it wasn't even his own business, that, the, uh, that what mattered was the performance. And so he approached this, uh, uh, this book, which was not his favorite, because we knew, he knew, uh, we knew that the publishers were mainly interested in Watergate, that that was, that was and which is fair enough. I mean, that's what people wanted to do. But it was not his favorite subject, to put it mildly. And uh, it was very close. Uh, so there, was, there hadn't been time to think about it and to absorb it. But he understood, uh, in a way, I think writing the book when we did, when he did, uh, was an act of courage on his part uh, to, to address these things before he was ready, before he felt that we had all the, he had enough material to think about it, and then time to assimilate it. So, uh, but he didn't show his emotions. He approached it in a very professional, uh, very businesslike way, and that's how he dealt with us, and that's, I, I hope that's how we dealt with him. Right. So talk about the, the impetus of the interviews that you conducted with former President Nixon in 1983. He used to say, no, no disrespect to Southern California, but, which he loved, uh, but he used to say that if we had written the book, if he had written the book in... Uh, New Hampshire, we would, have, we would have finished it a year earlier. He felt that, uh, that when every day is as perfect as the day before, that it, was, it wasn't exactly enervating, but it wasn't invigorating. So that was one thing. Um, and I've, I've now forgotten the other thing. Uh, what, was the, what was the genesis of your doing these interviews? He, in he, the, the, other, the other thing was that it was a very, he, used to, he said that this, you know, he wrote Six Crises, which was a bestseller in, in 1960, or 1961. And uh, he said that the seventh crisis was writing Six Crises. He was not, uh, he, temperamentally, uh, he was an intellectual. And I think, he, I think he liked, he reluctantly, he enjoyed the process of writing, but he didn't enjoy the process of writing, if you see what I mean. Or he enjoyed the process of writing, but not doing a book. Um, and he felt that, uh, as he said, and he was exactly right, he said, we're going to spend three or four years writing this. Roughly, he says, 300,000 people will buy it, and 330,000 people bought it. He says, 300,000 people will buy it, and a fraction of those will read it, will read all of it. He said, and he said, he said most of it will begin, a lot of them will begin by looking in the index for their name, and they won't get beyond that. <laughs> so, whereas for uh, television, of course, I mean, for, for him, it was a Hobson's choice. He didn't, that was, the, that was, that was what he had to do at that time. But he, he, he felt that, uh, that he could go on television and reach millions of people uh, in an hour or in two hours. So it wasn't a congenial uh, uh, 
thing for him. He always said that he, he would prefer to do it on television. So I, uh, after I left uh, San Clemente, I went back and worked for John Hines uh, in the uh, uh, Senate, a great man and a great loss to the country when he died in a plane crash in 1991. Um, I kept up with uh, the president. Uh, the president, Mrs. Nixon, invited me out for what I think was the last supper at the Casa Pacifica. And if it wasn't, it was the penultimate supper because we were surrounded by packing crates. But uh, he uh, toasted the book. He toasted the, uh, that the book was the, uh, the major accomplishment of his years in, uh, in San Clemente. And uh, then in 81, I worked uh, for a month for him on the chapter, on the Churchill chapter in Leaders. And then by 82, I was able to put together a production company to do what he had talked about, which was to prepare a television interviews about his life. And so uh, the, uh, uh, I, I like to ask uh, people what, uh, what Rupert Murdoch and I have in common, I mean, aside from the obvious. And uh, that, that is that uh, Roger Ailes has worked for both of us. And uh, so uh, I had known Roger because I worked for him on a couple of projects when I was in New York uh, trying to set up a communications business. And then I uh, contracted with Roger to be the producer and director of these videos. So to the extent that they look great, and I think they do, and uh, that, they were, uh, uh, that they were beautifully directed, that represents Roger's artistry. And it was part, I think, of the combination you talk about how comfortable Nixon felt to the extent that he ever felt comfortable when the camera was on him. But uh, I think part of that was that Roger was in the mix, and so they, they had gone back to uh, the 68 campaign and then, uh, and then to the White House. So we did these at uh, National uh, uh, Studios, uh, which is no longer, which was over at uh, 42nd between 9th and 10th. And, uh, they were uh, 38 hours. They were uh, uh, um, nine, four, five-hour sessions. Uh, the first one began was, was February 9th, 1983. This, this, the session from which these videos came was on June 10th. And then the last one was, I think, on September. It was 16th, but it was at any rate, it was in September. One of the stories that I was reminded of, I didn't remember, well, I didn't know about it. I was talking to one of the, uh, Jesse Rayford, who was one of uh, the producers on this. And in the studio, um, before we came in, the, uh, there had been some kind of a party, and these uh, big balloons had gone up into the rafters. And in the control room, they could see it. And in fact, one of the cameramen, instead of being focused on the president, was focused on these cameras coming down, heading towards these enormous lights. And uh, one of the Secret Service people in the control room had told them that if, if one of these the balloons hit the light, and uh, there was a pop that he, the Secret Service, would take out everybody in the control room. Uh, so while I'm, while I'm focusing on what I'm doing, there had this, other, this alternate drama is, is going on. Uh, but that was, we went, it was a hybrid form uh, where uh, I was taking him through, and uh, he had prepped for it. He knew uh, I was talking him through the memoirs. So to that, I wasn't a journalist. I had no... Uh, well, I had no reputation in any field, much less a journalistic field, so I, I, I was approaching him as an historian. And to talk him through his memoirs, to talk him through his life, to get that down on, uh, on tape. Uh, by the same token, I could ask any, the deal was that I could ask any question uh, that I wanted. And uh, I did, and in some cases I, uh, well, in a couple of cases I think I amused him, and in a couple of cases I irritated him. Uh, but it was this hybrid form of a, of a very structured thing to get his life down, but also uh, to be able to detour or to digress and to sort of ask any question. I, I, it was very, I, I, I thought it was a very productive, it was a very luxurious uh, format to have 38 hours over nine sessions. But uh, we began, the, um, uh, the first session was on February 7th. Stop me if I'm uh, blathering on here. I went out to the, uh, to the uh, Saddle River, to the house, and uh, on the 7th, the night before, and uh, for a dinner with him and Mrs. Nixon. And, well, this is going nowhere, but he opened a bottle of uh, 1955, it was memorable to me, 1955 uh, 
Lafitte, uh, 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 not Lafitte, uh, Mouton, uh, uh, Chateau Mouton Rothschild, and uh, described its qualities and uh, signed the bottle for me. I asked him afterwards to sign the bottle for me. So that was the that was the launch of the uh, the launch of these programs. This is Nixon nine years after leaving the White House, uh, in the middle of his post presidency, in a twenty year post presidency. How had he evolved in that nine year period, from the disgraced president uh, uh, first to resign the presidency to uh, really a, a resurgent former president, somebody in the middle of what became a very substantial and consequential post-presidency? Well, I'm, I'm, I, I almost hesitate to answer because I'm sitting in the, president, in the presence of the man who literally wrote the book <laughs> on this subject. Mark's uh, book, Second Acts, about post-presidencies is a, uh, is a, uh, a standard, a uh, gold standard. Um, at this point, uh, I think a couple of things had happened. One is he had had a uh, he had had an intimation of mortality. He'd almost died, and that uh, you know, like the prospect of being hanged, I think that tends to concentrate the mind. So he had uh, he had come off of that, and I think that had given him a perspective about life and uh, about life uh, and its alternative. And he was also more uh, relaxed in that. Uh, he didn't have to deal with politics. He could now, I think, in some ways, being a, a former president suited him very well because he could travel, he could write, he was essentially, you know, I have said, and I make this stuff up, but I've said that he might have been a, uh, uh, he might have been happier in some ways as a senator, that he was the, uh, that he was sort of a quintessential senator where you'd only have to run every six years, and it's kind of, if you're, if you're a good senator and you have a good operation, it's almost a sinecure. And, uh, and you can think, and you can burrow into issues, which was exactly what he liked to do. I mean, he could have been a brilliant, would have been a brilliant chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. He, he, he would have been the William, the William Fulbright of the right. He would have been Richard Lugar. I mean, no, a, a brilliant, distinguished career, making great contributions. And, uh, and playing to his strength. Politics, the, 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 the retail, the, the, uh, the hail fellow well met uh, element of politics. As he, as he told uh, Gary Wills in 1968, to understand me, you have to understand I'm an introvert in an extrovert's game. And so uh, with, with politics removed from the equation in these years, he could sort of settle into being himself more than before. Then I think also uh, another element was his family. He, had, he was uh, uh, living in New Jersey as they did. Uh, he and Mrs. Nixon were, I mean, they were always close, but now they were close because they spent just a lot more time together and he wasn't diverted by politics, which was never her favorite uh, thing. And uh, also, of course, he was a devoted uh, and loving father, but then he had grandchildren. And so he would play with them and they were all nearby. Uh, Tricia and Ed and Christopher in New York, and uh, Alex and uh, Jenny and Melanie and uh, David and Julie in uh, Pennsylvania, and outside Philadelphia. So they were all there. And then, of course, he'd had the chance to reflect on his life. He'd written the memoirs, and he had uh, he had seen that through a through a, a sort of an adversarial prism with Frost, and then through sort of a, ref a reflective prism with us, with the book staff. Um, and then the other thing, Nixon was a was was very he, he had a great sense of history and he had a great sense of occasion, and uh, of occasion, and so for him it would have meant uh, we it would have, it would have meant something to have reached three score years and ten, and he uh, you know the biblical the traditional allotment and he had reached that uh, we, our our first session was on February seventh he had reached uh, on February 9th, he had reached that a month earlier on January 9th. So he was 70 years old, and he was sort of looking back on this life with all these things. Um, and as, as uh, you say, and as, uh, as you know, uh, he was beginning, he was in the, the, the first stages of what became an enormously uh, productive, for him and I, I think for the world, uh, post-presidency. So I think that's what's that was what was different. I mean, I was lucky, I, was, I got him, I was in the right place at the right time to sit him down 
uh, unlike Frost, who uh, had really had, it was, that was like a press, and we prepared him. I mean, uh, we, we, the book staff prepared him for Frost, and we prepared him like, it would have, like he would have been prepared for a press conference in the White House with books of questions, and uh, uh, so it was, it was not a reflective thing. It was a wonderful thing. I, I mean, I think in, in, it, it worked out well for Nixon and for history that the Frost interviews accomplished things for David Frost and for Nixon and for history to give him to, to, uh, to almost to, to make him think aggressively about things and then to allow him to think reflectively about the same subject matter. Right. We, we ended the, the clips with that very emotional uh, clip of Nixon talking about the couplet that he received from Claire Booth Luce. Uh, but Claire Booth Luce would famously tell presidents that they would be remembered in one sentence. And at one point, she said to Nixon that your sentence will be, Nixon, he went to China. She, she uh, uh, sent him a letter, and she said, uh, after he came back from China, and she said, uh, a thousand years from now, it will be said of you, he went to China. Within uh, 18 months, she had to, re, re, to add something uh, to that. But uh, so, so, uh, and, and that couplet that he reads is it really alludes to all the rising and falling that he did throughout his political career, and perhaps he had the most volatile uh, career of any politician, at least in the latter part of the 20th century. What is, uh, what, what do you believe history will ultimately say about Richard Nixon? Well, once again, I'm in the presence of the man who's written the book on this subject because you're, and I'm blanking on the title, but about uh, uh, the presidents who become uh, pre uh, uh, presidents who become president at turning points, crisis points, in American history. Baptism it's, by fire. Yeah. Baptism by fire. A available at fine bookstores everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and indeed, Nixon uh, became, if, if there were tipping points uh, uh, where the country could have uh, imploded or exploded. Uh, Lincoln in 1861, FDR in 32, Nixon in 68. I mean, the country, uh, people have forgotten that, I think. A lot of people have forgotten that. A lot of people were too young to remember it. Um, so he became uh, president at a very tumultuous time. And, uh, and not the least of his accomplishments was uh, to, to sort of, and, and ha, was to ride that, that countercultural wave. And he was the least, the most, the, the, the most uncount, the least counter, he was the most counterintuitive person to ride the countercultural wave because he was, uh, on a 10 point scale, uh, a square. And uh, <laughs> he, so how, how he will be uh, remembered? Uh, I think he will be remembered as the most, uh, as a very, uh, consequential, a very uh, controversial, and a very interesting president. Uh, consequential because of the times in which he, uh, he, he just showed up at the right time, or the, as you look at it, the country was on a tipping point. Um, and the, 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 the things that, with which he had to deal uh, the first uh, terrorist, the first uh, terrorist attacks, uh, taking over planes. The first terrorism message was sent to Congress by Nixon. The first uh, w welfare reform, uh, health care reform. Three months before uh, Senator Kennedy, Ted Kennedy died, he told Farah, um, I'm blanking, uh, a reporter from the uh, uh, Boston Globe that one of his uh, uh, that, that he had missed an opportunity in 1973 by not, uh, by not voting for the Nixon health care plan because nothing that good had come up uh, since. Uh, the first energy uh, report to the Congress went. So the, the issues with which Nixon was dealing are the issues that are still very much with us today and the, uh, the work that was being done and particularly in the domestic council under John Ehrlichman. Uh, the 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 the, the uh, free thinking, the encouragement of all kinds of ideas, all of which was put down on paper. There's 44, I believe, uh, for the archivist uh, David Ferriero, the archivist of the United States, has said that the Nixon administration is the most documented uh, between the tapes and the uh, the papers of any administration, and uh, only the tip of the iceberg uh, has has yet been discovered. And sitting right below us. 
uh, in the archives are these uh, millions of papers, and, and uh, both on foreign and domestic policy. So I think as scholars begin to come out here to Yorba Linda, uh, which is now the, the center of Nixon scholarship, you know, Passels, as I say in my colorful way, uh, some people say it's colorful, and I suppose it is, uh, that uh, Passels of Pulitzers and uh, uh, thousands of d doctoral dissertations are sitting below us as people begin to delve into the other story of the Nixon uh, administration. So I think he'll be consequential uh, for that reason. I think he'll be controversial because for, I don't think that needs much expounding, and I don't think that's going to, even as the, 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 the geezers uh, who have a, a dog in that hunt, uh, shuffle off the coil. Uh, those pa the passions will fade, but the controversy will remain. And, uh, and I think that's uh, interesting and good because controversy breeds, uh, uh, controversy just uh, uh, breeds ideas and uh, enlightenment. And uh, interesting because he's just so darn interesting. He's uh, all, he, he is Shakespearean really. If you think about the, the highs and the the lows that his, as he said, the mountaintops and the, deep, the the highest mountains and the deepest valleys that he experienced in his life. It's just, it, it is it is uh, Shakespearean or Tolstoyan. Uh, it's epic. And then the other thing I think he'll be remembered the way I remember him is that that his, just the incredible, you know, like him or not, the incredible quality of resilience. Uh, in that East Room speech, he says. Uh, it's only a beginning. You know, he's talking about how everything is terrible. And, and he just read a quote from Theodore Roosevelt about the death of his wife. And so, and then Nixon says, uh, you know, but uh, it's only a beginning always. The young must know it. The old must know it. And it must always sustain us. Uh, and that the greatness, and he doesn't talk about greatness. He says the greatness, because he's not talking about great him being greater. He's talking about the greatness comes not when things always go good for you, but when uh, things go bad and you take some knocks and when sorrow or, or when sadness, when disappointments and sadness comes, that's when the greatness thing. And I think his, uh, you know, he said never, he said always dream of the future, never think about the past. And uh, I think people will, uh, will, will look at, will take that away as a legacy, uh, as part of his legacy, this, this idea of resilience and optimism and uh, just moving forward. Well, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. And Frank, I want to thank you for not only sharing these remarkable tapes, but uh, for your wonderful insights well, into thank a you. very enigmatic man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that's okay. <laughs>